it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Big Rock Candy Mountain is a fictional place often mentioned in American folk songs and stories. It's a mythical and idealized location, sometimes depicted as a hobo's paradise or a utopia for those facing hardships, particularly during the Great Depression era. In various versions of the song Big Rock Candy Mountain, the lyrics describe a land where there are no worries, the sun shines every day and life is easy. It's portrayed as a place where food is plentiful, the rivers flow with lemonade, and various comforts are easily accessible. The concept of the Big Rock Candy Mountain has been used as a metaphor for an idyllic, carefree existence, offering an escape from the challenges and struggles of real life, just as we'll see in the first episode of a new series that I'm about to narrate for you. So, without further ado, let's begin... The Big Rock Candy Mountain by Hugh A. Hu Part 1 In the Big Rock Candy Mountain, all the bulldogs have no tea. Levi mumbled, tapping out the rest of the brown crumbs from a wrinkled, tiny dime bag into a spoon that studied life with the best of intentions, but now found itself an unwitting participant in illegal activity. Now, there's a hundred reasons I won't give you my real name. For our purposes, you can call me Kevin. Uh, Again with that fucking song, I say, my bank card moving like the trowel of a master bricklayer, creating three equal lines off of white powder. Levi looks to me with a half-there grin, the dog kibble in his spoon starting to melt and sputter. Ah, you wouldn't get it, he almost whispers, giggling to himself. I don't press the issue, but I find myself thinking that it might be the dumbest thing I've ever heard him say. Now, Levi and myself, we've been through everything from kindergarten to weekend jail together. Small towns make close friends. Hard drugs make shit brothers. Between the two of them, Levi and I may as well be the same damn person. But lately, well, he hasn't been himself. The sharper folks out there may have caught on to the fact that neither of us are what you call positive role models. And while it's true the two of us like to live like rock stars in the six hours a day we don't work, this change, it's not getting in a little over your head with coke or pills. Uh, It's something else. The steel straw seems to ring as I make short work of the lines. My heart begins to kick and a grin begins to bruise. One that only slightly falters when I see Levi fall back to the couch, Rick still sticking out of his arm. Well, I can't say I've never touched a needle, but that shit being your go-to, that shows you've taken the first step to giving up on life. For a better person, the sight of their best, almost only friend in this state would be a wake-up call. And maybe it would have been for me as well, but God, I had to listen. Oh, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Levi mumbles, finally taking the blood-stained needle from his arm and placing it on the table. I know it's nothing more than heroin ramblings, but I'm in the takeoff stage of a night of uppers, so paint drying would be golden globe worthy to me. Every culture has one, you know. A place better than heaven. The Romans had the land of wine and cheese. We have the big rock candy mountain. For a second I hear a little of the old Levi. Before we both decided it was easier to weld 18 hours a day and fry our brains for another fall. I've always been a bit of a dumbass. I'll be the first one to admit that. But for a while it looked like Levi was going to get out of this shithole little southern Ontario town. Bait club, international exchange, even a bit of a scholarship. But at the end of the day, where I went, Levi went. By the end of grade 12, I wasn't going anywhere good. He stayed on that nod for hours, spewing crazy shit about tunnels under our old high school. Free drugs, smokes and booze. Just real dopehead fantasy crap. But, as high as I was, I wasn't going to stop listening. I've seen a lot of friends fall to drug use. Probably one of the most common side effects of using your brain as a chemistry set. 
But the month-long rocket train from Gonzo Journeyman to Meth Goblin I saw Levi take. And it shocked me. It fucking disgusted me. Not even 30 days later, early December, I was staring at a shadow of the man I'd known. We've always had an unspoken rule. Our problem's our business. While Levi hadn't borrowed or stolen a cent, I couldn't let him keep up screwing his life to this extent. Fired. Homeless. Wearing a spring jacket, jeans stiff with grime, and a shirt I hope wasn't white at one point in time. His hair is peach fuzz and psoriasis, and his gaze is vacant. Man, you need to get your shit together. Well, I'm not angry, or even loud. I just want to reach him. My shit hasn't been this together in years, Kev. Regardless of his look, his voice is clear. With it, despite all evidence to the contrary, he seems sober. Oh, you think I'm just going down the same road all your old friends did, but I'm not, man. You're never going to understand it, but I'm Christopher Columbus, or Buzz Aldrin. Yeah, I found something new, something real, something goddamn awesome. But getting there isn't just a matter of finding the place. It's not a physical journey, but a spiritual one. I spent a lot of time thinking about what Levi might say when I called him out, and how I was going to respond. I thought I was ready for anything, but I found myself staring at him dumbfounded. Oh, I know you think I spend my life just riding in your wake, but I realized something pretty early. I'd never be happy being one of those poor assholes we get out of this place for a couple of years only to come back, strap on a hard hat and work myself to death on a pipeline. I wanted something more, or at least something different. I found it, man. After all this time, I goddamn found it. Levi, the look of cultist bliss on his face. I found myself at the same time wanting to dump out every bag in my place and dying for a hit of something. With a snort, I made the wrong decision. So why haven't I found this place, Levi? I said, out of my depth. Different kinds of people, Kev. I love you, man, but drugs not doing you any good. In fact, that's why I came here tonight. Not for your almost intervention here, but to tell you something. After tonight, I'll be gone. I don't want you wasting your time trying to find me. If I could take you, I would, man. This, this is where we part ways. For your own good, just move on from all of this shit. Me, the booze, the coke, and all the rest of it. I worry about you. Levi's voice was that of a professor, his body a mess of minor wounds, filth, and sores. I handle the stark truth about as well as someone addicted to stimulants, for the most part, can. I scream in rage, defensively protecting my ego and making only petty, snide comments toward Levi's situation. He kept that Buddhist level of calm, replying to me with acceptance bordering on pretension. I didn't see him pick up the box car. I was too slow to stop him jamming it deep in his left arm and wildly dragging it through his flesh. I didn't scream or bleed, and the flesh hung open, tattered, glistening, but missing even a single drop of crimson. He wiggled his fingers. Should be impossible. Tendons and flesh hanging like ruined wiring. The limit of my mental capacity. Fell to the couch, stunned. If I said nothing else, simply pulled his jacket over his arm and gave me a look that said, You don't understand, but that's okay. He walked out of my apartment for the last time. Well, it wasn't the last time I saw him, though. That was when I was brought to the city morgue to identify his body. He looked great. Healthy, ripped. No signs of the hard turn into pure addiction he took about a year previous. I chalked it up to come into his senses. Maybe a good stint in rehab. Something else drew my attention, more than the 40 pounds of muscle, or the clear skin, or his nails. Oh, it could have been polish or gloss or... Whatever the hell people use. But it looked too deep. Too dark. Ah, you noticed it as well. 
the coroner said. Flying in the face of tradition, he was a large, dark-skinned, jovial man. Keratin vascularization. Rare, but not unheard of at all. In affected individuals, the body supplies keratin, nails, hair, and so on, with an overabundance of nutrients via tiny, almost filament-like veins. Nothing life-destroying, but from what I hear, makes haircuts and nail clipping a bit of a chore. Well, I understood about half of what he said, but that was enough to make me break out into a cold sweat that, for once, had nothing to do with narcotics. My left. The coroner is a bit too close to being a cop for my liking. Well, I knew I had nothing to do with Levi's death. Pigs will find a way to screw you over, given enough time. I felt like being dramatic. I would have said it was where my journey started. But that would be a lie. And my journey had started about the age 15 when I decided that every bit of good advice I was given didn't compare with playing Pac-Man in the medicine cabinet. Yeah, smart people. They don't start that kind of journey. I didn't come to some eureka moment. No. My fixation was immediate, blunt and unfocused. Hours after I'd left the cold antiseptic morgue, I was doing a shit job of research with a lot of gusto. I cut down on the drugs since the night Levi decided to play Operation. Well, that still left me somewhere between casual user and waste of skin. My mind is as sharp as it's been in a long time. It was boring at first. As I found myself swimming deeper into this ocean of myths, religion, conspiracy theories and urban legends, I booked weeks and then months off work. Well, the first and most obvious point was that Levi was right concept of a subheaven, a place that isn't connected to the divine or the infernal, but still a paradise, was a trend going back to the first depictions of the afterlife. But it was more than that. It wasn't simply a running trope or a bit of religious copy and paste. Now, the more you look, the more you could pinpoint this concept, changing and evolving. Which, of course, led me to the song I'm sure a lot of, if not all of you, are aware of. And if you haven't heard it, I'll spare you the trouble. It's a stupid-sounding fucking song. Seriously, I'm not trying to be dismissive here. The song is dumb as hell, given context or not. No one has ever lost money betting on the lowest common denominator. Stupid can spread in certain circles faster than herpes. A catchy tune. Promises of one-legged cops and cigarette trees. Well, it spread quickly through folks down on their luck. Stupid, sure, but... When you're half dying of starvation, half insane from self-induced brain rot, and all the way given up on life, what's the harm in trying to find the end of the rainbow? Levi didn't have some rare condition. Something changed him. As much as asking the scariest people I knew if they'd heard of the Big Rock Candy Mountain it made me feel like a complete goddamned idiot, and once got me punched in the face. I knew... Is the only way to find answers, though. Answer's name, as it turned out, was Johnny, and it cost me fifteen hundred and a handful of gratis party favors to find him. Junkies, man. I probably talked to thirty old heads who thought they could bullshit me into a payday. But this guy, no, he didn't seek me out. He didn't even seem to want to talk once I found him. But with a little bribery begging and being a bastard, I got him to agree to a sit-down. I met him in an old run-down warehouse, part of the course as far as my day-to-day life goes. But whew, this place it wasn't somewhere he knew. I could tell the moment I turned the rusted doorknob and saw inside. No, this was where he lived. He was 60, studded leather jacket barely restraining his shirtless gut. He was a relic. Someone old when punk was new, and holding on to its long-since-purchased morality with every ounce of strength he had. If it sounds like I'm talking shit about him, I'm not. And what I'm saying is, this guy, he had a vibe, no, more than that, fucking aura. He smiled, sunglasses reflecting the flames of a toxic-smelling fire in a vented barrel. It was damn near three in the morning, but he seemed to have no trouble seeing me. 
numerous horrible tattoos, faded by years and fights, shift as he pointed to me, cheap rings covering almost every finger. For a second, he appeared more Roma shaman than Sex Pistol. You don't look nearly fucked up enough to want to talk about this. He was drunk. Even if I was deaf, I'd have smelled the astringent waft of his hundred-proof breath. Man, you have to spend 1500 on a conversation. Doesn't leave much for smack. Been doing conspiracy theory rehab, you could say. I surveyed the ground for anything pointy before I sat beside the man. He rummaged through a leather sports bag, contents within shuffling and clinking together. I noticed his smell. Something off, but it would just be the dozens of half-empty takeout containers scattered around this hovel. Oh, we're going to fix that tonight, my son, don't you worry, Johnny said, producing what I could say with no exaggeration had to be the world's largest freebase pipe. It was a home-brewed monstrosity, ancient neon tube, still stained a faded pink. The bowl, I later found out, was made of a glass piece, usually used to connect power lines, a fist-sized hollow glass half-sphere. Whoa. Big enough to set up, bud? I said, legitimately shocked. Johnny laughed. A toxic, phlegm-ridden cough filled Chortle. Ah, it's never big enough, kid. You see, the hippies and the shaman, all those self-discovery assholes and Honda S. Thompson wannabes, they're dumb as fuck. Not as touched as your average Joe Lunchpail, but at least Joe fucking Lunchpail isn't trying to figure anything out. They got down how to find a car, but never learned how to drive, if you follow. And if you're looking to start a journey that doesn't end anywhere the rules apply, there's only one way, little guy. That sure shit ain't dropping acid or making mushroom tea. And the old man gave me a rotten grin, packing the pipe full of a combination of the worst things you can pay for as he talked. All I want to do is know what happened to a friend of mine, I replied. Oh, you want me to tell you a bunch of stories you're going to stop believing in about a week? No, that's not how this goes. You ask for what might be the most sensitive information in the whole fucking universe. More than that, kiddo. You asked me to tell you about the only time in my life I've been scared. Johnny shook his head. Didn't like the unspoken malice in his voice. Despite the fact he had to be old enough to be my grandfather... Something that was holding me back from just grabbing the old bastard and beating what I wanted to know out of him. You wanna know? Well, you have to understand. And if you wanna understand... Johnny popped a long wooden match, running its orange flame around the glass bowl. After a few seconds, the contents began to crackle and hiss. Then he took a pull of this arm-sized stroke waiting to happen. That would have been impressive if it was filled with nothing more than tobacco. I tried to remember any CPR and realized if this old prick starts to OD, I'd have nothing more than good wishes until the ambulance showed up. But he didn't. He simply kept smoking. Thick yellow puffs reeking of battery acid and cat piss began to build up until they were floating like low-hanging clouds. I began to get impatient, waiting for the old man to start talking starting to wonder how in the hell the cloud of bad decisions and broken dreams around me wasn't just blowing away in the drafty warehouse. Contact high began to set in as Johnny put down the pipe and suddenly shot out his right arm, holding it in front of the fire. One by one he began to take off the rings covering his fingers, dropping each one onto the ground with a high pitching ringing. I found myself entranced, my heart beginning to race. Why? Well, Maybe high. Maybe something a little harder to explain. Who's to say? He paused for a moment, then got to his pinky finger. And the rings began to pop off, seemingly of their own accord. As the last one fell, what I saw sent me scrambling backward, reaching to my waistband for the Saturday night special I purchased in the event that things got shittier than expected. It was gone. Johnny held it in one hand, cylinder open. Bullets nowhere to be seen. I thought going around armed to the teeth was an American thing, he said. As he stood, the flames rose. I could make out the tattoo across his chest through the scars and grime. 
a Caterpillar Heavy Equipment logo. I'm sure has quite the story behind it. But all of this strangeness paled in comparison to what those pinky rings were hiding. It started folded. Thin black segments, like a spider's leg bound by the metal rings. When it unfurled, it was nearly two feet long, with a wicked-looking flat point. The fire made its glossy surface shimmer and flare with light. Johnny reached down with the appendage, and it began to poke and prod the smouldering narcotics, expertly rearranging substances to keep the bowl lit and the smoke billowing. And with one final fuck you to any rules of reality I had ever known, the proboscis started to glow red, heat haze shimmering off of it as it somehow heated the bowl. Johnny dropped the gun, walked over to me. I still hadn't managed to stand. Transfixed as I am, I took the pipe when offered. My brain screamed with overload, my ears rang, and I hit the floor, coughing, gagging, and then puking. My world was out of sync. Speech wouldn't come. It was all I could do to keep my eyes open, no matter how fast my heart was hammering. A little present from my time at the mountain. Johnny answered the question I didn't remember asking. This is how far things can and will go. You know what I was before all of this? The thin black tendril ran its point down my cheek. Fucking anthropology undergraduate. I went into finding the mountain with a paid-for staff, doctors, lawyers, even a couple of hard men, just to make sure we all stayed safe. Oh, I was so close I could taste it. I had evidence. Plenty of it. As goddamned out there as the concept was, couldn't hide itself completely. What I failed to realize is this isn't a journey you can take with other people. At the mountain, there are plenty of other idiots who think they've found Valhalla. But to get there, you've got to take that challenge on yourself. Johnny was preaching. There was a power in that voice, and his sermon hoped me wrapped. But, oh, silver linings and all that shit. Losing my career, my home, my reputation, well, that put me in the perfect place to actually find the mountain. Or rather, have the mountain find me. See, there's no actual place, no entrance. All of the bullshit junkies spew about secret tunnels or abandoned factories. That's metaphor wrapped in exaggeration, filled with idiocy. Well, it isn't desperation that gets you there. Well, if that was the case, it'd be full of cancer patients and hurricane victims. Uh, what gets you there is a full and deep understanding of what you're giving up, what you're willing to take in return. Piece by piece, bit by bit, if you're strong enough, dedicated enough, you find your way there, already changed and welcomed with open arms. Johnny snapped his fingers a half inch in front of my face, and in an instant, I found myself brought back to reality. The air around me somehow no longer a toxic miasma. The man in front of me no longer some demon priest, but a high, blown-out old rocker once again. Ah, uh, you already know. That's not really what this place is doing, don't you? Johnny asked, bending down with a groan of pain, and beginning to collect his rings from the floor. Yeah, pretty sure they, um... Or it, whatever. Killed a friend of mine, I replied. Ah, uh, not unheard of, but a little strange... In the mountain, it does everything it can to keep the folks housed there living. It gets what it needs from willing subjugation. Corpses aren't too good at that. Your friend, he must have come across something he shouldn't. Not to make you shit yourself too hard, but the fact they let someone find the body, that's likely a warning. Johnny sat, starting to put the rings back on. Fuck him. I'll... Uh... I started, but got interrupted by a hoarse laugh from Johnny. <laughs> You'll do exactly what, little boy. You think you're the first person to try and go in there full of piss and vinegar? Oh, God, kid, you're thick. I got out because of pure luck. I got out almost as soon as I got in, and I still didn't come out whole. That's what all this has been about. Showing you this isn't a fight you want. And even if you're so damn stupid you think it is... It's not one you can win, because there's no fight to be had. 
Oh, you could nuke the fucking well at the glass, my son. Somewhere in the center of the fishbowl, the mountain would still be there. I wanted to argue, but based on every bit of information I gathered, Johnny's right. But I didn't come to this voodoo meth shack to argue. I didn't even come here expecting some kind of roadmap to my own damnation. I'd already done my work, and that map was pretty much drawn already. Johnny gave me that last, most crucial piece of any map, what anything needs. Scale. So yes, yes, I know, I've been mentioning these uh, new serial, well, feature-length stories that I'm going to serialize for you for on and off, I don't know how long, weeks, months, yeah, quite a while. So I finally got around to um, putting out the first episode of this one. Um, it's a really good story, and it just gets better and better as it goes on, so I hope you enjoyed that first part. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below uh, about this, because I will be continuing it um, very soon, actually. But yeah, that was the first part. So let me know what you thought of that, that because I am going to be continuing it, and I want your support to do so, obviously. Uh, right, well, that's it. Crazy cold here, uh, about 20 centimetres of snow fallen over the last couple of days. Icy cold and treacherous weather. How is it where you are? Let me know um, how you're dealing with um, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, or the summer, for those of you in the South, <laughs> I guess. All right, well, I'm starting to waffle on here tonight. Long few days at work, crazy busy, but it's going to be over fairly soon. Back to my normal schedule here. Well, my dear friends, that is enough for one evening. Back again soon, like I said. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.